Hey guys. Hey Doug. Good morning. Good morning. Vlad, it's been a while. Where have you been? Yeah, sorry for disappearing without a trace. <laughs> I retired and I started with a lot of relaxation. You retired? Are you kidding me? It's my third time. I never managed to stay retired more than four months because I get bored. <laughs> we'll, we'll see how long it takes now. We'll see. You're so funny. All right. Hey, Timur. Hey, Doc. How are you? Good. Doo -doo -doo. Hello. Oh, hello, Kevin. Sorry, I missed you. I was checking email. Who else we got here? Hey, Tommy. Hey. And Honky? Honky? I apologize. I'm bad with names. Yeah, Honky. Okay, thank you. <laughs> this isn't your first time on the call, is it? Uh, no, I actually I was here the week before. Okay, that's what I thought. Oh, actually, that's a good point. Let me check something here. There were a couple of people who recently joined that I did not get their company affiliation. What what company are you with in case you want to be affiliated with the company? Uh, Alibaba Cloud. Ah, okay, actually, I, th I think I did put that. Hold on, because I remember some, adding somebody to Alibaba recently. There you go, already got you, cool. Okay, Never mind. Bad short-term memory. Hey, Lucas. Hey, how's it going? Good, how are you? Good. Excellent, and Lance. Hey, Doug. Hello. Klaus. Yes, hello. Hello. Do -do -do. Refresh my memory, Klaus. Three weeks? Yes. Okay. <laughs> you bum, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's Germany. I know, that's, I know. That's, that, that is how it's supposed to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what you say. <laughs> Do -do -do. Envith? I'm not sure how you pronounce that. I apologize if I'm... Oh, no microphone yet. Never mind. So Klaus, when you're on vacation for three weeks, do you not even check your mail and just let it all pile up? Well, I, I try to. <laughs> I find that if I, if I don't do my mail when I'm on vacation, it's just, it's, it'd, it'd be worse when I get back because then you're spending like the next three or four days just going through email. I, I literally throw the email accounts off my phone and okay. I also, log on from Teams, and I never look into anything during those weeks. Wow. Yeah, I'm, I'm super consequent on those, on those things. That's amazing. Yeah. Hey, All right. People will follow up on emails. It's safe to ignore them. 
I feel guilty. Yeah. I really do. Uh, I actually have an out of office message which says, I'm not going to look at your email. If you want something, send me email on the day when I come back. Hmm. Okay, I got another question, but let me, let me do my admin <laughs> stuff here. <laughs> Brian, are you there? I'm here and plus one to the deep disconnect camp. <laughs> All right, Christian. Morning, Doug. Morning. Um, Envith, I apologize if I'm butchering your name. No, you got it perfectly right. Okay. Sorry. And which company are you with if you want to be associated with a company? Uh, uh, I work for HelloFresh. We are based out of Berlin in Germany. Okay. So this is my first time because I stumbled upon cloud events when I was looking through something. So I just joined this call out of curiosity. Cool. Well, thank you for joining. And I know I'm going to get this one wrong. Yuquin, Y-O-U-Q-U-I-N-G. Are you there? Okay. What about Scott? No, no, no. Hello. Matthias. Uh, hello, everybody. Hello. Um, okay. I thought, I thought someone else joined. Oh, there he is. Thomas, are you there? Yep, I'm here. Excellent. Am I missing anybody? Oh, you can? You, you can? I, I apologize. <laughs> hey, guys. Hello. hello. There we go. Got it. And which company are you with, if you want to be associated with a company? Oh, uh, Adobe. Adobe? Adobe. T-U-B-I. Oh, oh, interesting. I recently was looking into you guys for some video stuff. Interesting. All right. Um, it is technically time, but let me just get the last couple of folks. Colin, are you there? I am. Good morning. Good morning. I could have sworn I saw someone else go by. Slinky, are you there? Hello, hello. Hello. And Ryan, are you there? Yes, I am. Hello. Hello. Okay. Did I miss anybody? Oh, wait. We have another Christian. Uh, me. <laughs> yes. Remy. Yeah. I got, okay. Remy, I got you. Okay. And then there was, there was another Christian that went flying by. I could have sworn. Where was he? There he is. T Z O V O L O V. Are you there, Christian? Gotcha. All right. Let's go ahead and get started. Probably going to be a short call anyway. Um, let's see what, okay, community time. Anything from the community that people like to bring up that's not on the agenda? All right, not hearing anything. Uh, we do have an SDK call scheduled for this week. I believe as of right now, there's only one very, very minor thing on the agenda. Can I, I, can I say something in the community yeah. time? Please, of course, yes. And, and, um, and ask those folks who, who are, who joined out of curiosity, what speci specifically they're curious about. <laughs> uh, okay, since I was the guy who said that, I'm gonna go first. Yes. <laughs> so uh, basically uh, we, we were trying to at HelloFresh, uh, I don't know how many guys of you know HelloFresh, we are a meal kit subscription company that's based out of Berlin, Germany. Uh, so we had a, uh, we had a, we were trying to tackle a problem where we wanted to store some some of the events that mobile app or the front end would publish and then you know store it in s3 or somewhere for analysis in the future so and then i was just looking at what what kind of products are already available and just from one link to other i just uh, and then i just came across the cloud events spec, spec and here i am okay great thank you anybody else want to chime in All right, cool. Moving forward then. Uh, we do have an SDK call scheduled for this week, but there's only one minor item on there. Um, probably not worthy of having a call just for that. Um, take it offline, especially since it's mine and I won't be able to join the call. But if you do have other topics, please add it to the agenda before this call ends and then someone else can run that meeting since I won't be able to make it. Okay. Uh, Timur, anything from the workflow side of things you wanna bring up? Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, as far as what we're currently working on, we're adding uh, extension points to our workflow definitions, uh, such as uh, KPI and simulation. So those are uh, extensions that are specification provided and allow you to add like uh, non-execution type of stuff like key performance indicators or information about 
uh, simulation and stuff like that. So that's as far as working goes and kind of like just shameless plug, uh, our next meeting is uh, August 3rd. <laughs> uh, and we are actually finally on the CNCF public events calendar, which is a big plus, so. All right, any that's questions? It, yep, thank you. Any questions for him? All right. All right, moving forward. Before we jump into the PRs, anything on the agenda that I forgot to add that we should talk about? Okay. Um, this one, Klaus, you're still not convinced. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> um, so, so Klaus, it seems, correct me if I'm wrong, it seems like you're you're just not sure we actually need this. So I guess my question for you is, how would somebody as a client uh, receiving the list of services um, know whether in any particular service is an existing one just had all its metadata changed and therefore they should just do an update versus it's a brand new service? By the same name, I guess. So you're assuming yeah, we, the name needs to be immutable. Yes. Or if you um, change the name, then it's technically a new service. What do people think about yeah. that? I do agree with Klaus on that one. I was not voicing on GitHub, but I do agree with you. So if someone had a typo, there was a company buyout and they needed to change the name from IBM something to Microsoft something, even though it is the exact same service, the name cannot change. Mm -hmm. Correct. So my, my point is that those services are, and the metadata are provided, I mean, they are developed by someone and probably then aggregated at some place um, in this discovery service. And, and so this metadata is uh, kind of a development artifact. And if you had to um, put a huge ID into this and maintain it, I don't know, it feels a bit awkward. Uh, okay. Uh, alternative would be to generate that UUID inside that discovery service. But then if you update the metadata as developer, um, how would that, this then work? So, yeah. So you said something interesting there. Um, it was always my assumption that the ID is generated by the service itself. It would not be something that the user would explicitly set when they add a new service to the system. Uh, does that change? Oh, okay. But what does that mean by the service itself? So, um, um, re rephrase the question. I'm not quite sure I'm following. Okay. <laughs> um, how would that work? The service itself generates the UUID. Is sir, the, well, that, 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 I don't mean the service. I, I mean, the, the, the rest of the data is, is provided by someone, the, the metadata. Right. right. Yeah. What point would then the UUID be uh, generated? Right, so it gets generated by the system in the same way the, the UUID is generated by the system in Kubernetes, right? Um, <clears throat> it's returned to the users when they query the system so they could see it, but that would be the way they uniquely identify it, right? Because, I mean, if I'm the only one that thinks not being able to do a rename is, is, is crazy, then that's fine, I'll let it go. So, it's just, so I, it's this, just from, from my experience in Kubernetes, I, I hate it. I hate that I can't rename things in Kubernetes. In Kubernetes, I'm sorry. <laughs> in Kubernetes, <laughs> the, the, the UUID is, is generated and identifies then the resource in the context of that specific cluster. Correct. And, and that's what I was asking before in, in my previous comments. So what I was targeting at, because I was actually looking at the um, specifications uh, for uh, on the Kubernetes end, how they define the UID they have for resources. I mean, so so what context would this be okay. here? Sorry. No, so, so I, I, I guess I'm not seeing much of a difference because I believe the UID in, even in Kubernetes is globally unique, I think, I'm not 100% sure, but I thought it was supposed to be unique across clusters so that you can do imports and exports across clusters. And in particular, what's the term they used? Uh, 
Yes, I, but it's the resource on that specific cluster then, yeah. even though it's unique. Yes. Well, I, I have to go back and double check and see what happens if you were to do an import export, whether it retains the UID or not, I can't remember. But it exports the UID and they are unique per cluster. So when you do an import, it gets reset? Vlad? Sorry, audio issues. Uh, I think the version get, gets bumped, like for an update, isn't it? I might be wrong on this. I think version is different than ID though. But anyway, so Clemens, were you gonna say something earlier? You, know, you may have gone chopped off. Uh, yeah, sorry. Um, since this is the, not the name, but the, the identifier, I don't see that much of a problem with it. Wait, a problem which direction? I'm not sure if that means you're in you favor or against the PR. <laughs> yeah, well, you are saying, you're saying that uh, you hate for things not to be renamed. Right. And, but this is not renaming, this is re-identifying and that's, that's different. So I, I agree, I agree with, with uh, the, the name, um, the, the ID never changing. Yes, yes. If we set the PR, the, the ID is immutable. That, that's a given. The, the question I think yeah. in front of us is, <clears throat> do we really need this or should we just mandate that name cannot change and that name becomes immutable? I think that's the question before the group. Ah. Um, yeah, name, names, names being changeable is something that's probably more... That's something that's more convenient. And that's why we would have the difference because names can be, there can be typos or you can go and change your mind or you can, you, you start with a particular name and then the marketing department comes around and gives you a brand. Exactly. Et cetera. Exactly. Those are the things that I wanted to avoid because, because these, I mean, even the examples we give here for name, they're not exactly unique in that sense, right? I mean, the word storage is, <laughs> is pretty generic, right? And as you said, someone yeah. could come along and say, hey, don't screw up your existing customers because they're still using this thing. But you know what? We need to call this IBM storage. But who's yeah. generating the UID in your case? Because when I implement the discovery, it makes sense to me to put a name, but the UID, if I generate it on the fly, it won't, uh, it won't stand. So that means I, I need to then create yeah, I was assuming it'd be generated by the discovery service itself. In other words, the system that's that's persisting this this metadata, and it would just generate a yeah. unique ID for it. But then that means the discovery service needs to have something to store to store it while basically. But maybe my implementation was wrong. But my, in my implementation, it's just driven by the code, so I have nowhere to put those kind of uh, generated UID in or inside the code. Or I create a JSON next to your code, but then I find it not clean. So you're Maybe. writing a stateless discovery service? Yeah. So basically, for, but again, maybe it's because the way I, I did understand it was not the right way. But uh, in my opinion, when I create a service, I was able to create, to expose a discovery service while waiting, while creating the service by itself. And so the discovery service is stateless, it's just inside my code and just with the three lines of code, I expose um, the discovery service with all yeah, the I, different services. But that's maybe my uh, interpretation that was wrong. But, uh, yeah, in that, that case, I would have to issue. Yeah, in that case, I think you'd have to change your code to include another field called ID and, and stick a UUID in there. The same way you create a field called name and you stick some name in there, right? Because everything's static yeah, to you, exactly. right? Yeah, and yeah. then it's like the user to create it. But I don't see the the added value because I think the name rename it's fine to expose basically the same service with two names. Because if you rename at the end, what you end up doing is expose the same service with two names, and then a human can say, okay, like I know that uh, I be like the Microsoft is deprecated because it has been bought by IBM. So within one year, I'll have to change this name from uh, like Microsoft to IBM. 
output is, and then as a discovery service, you just expose those two services under the two names and like yeah, see, you can I, manage I think, the migration. Yeah, from a programmatic perspective, I, I, I have real concerns about that because as, as a person writing code is on a client side, I would have no idea what to do with that because they would show up as two yeah, different services and but they're really the same that, service that means you add the constraint that the discovery service needs to have a state so now you we need to have a database to run a discovery service so the discovery yeah. service is no 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 it doesn't have to right because in your particular case you have everything hard coded in your code right mm -hmm. so yeah, I, then, in, your, yeah. in your particular case you'd hard code the id <laughs> yeah, that's not really good. And then I have to explain to the user using it that they need to generate a fake, like whatever you ID and put it there. Wait, yeah. wait, no, wait, uh, wait, 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 no, wait. I, I really want to understand your scenario. Why would a why would a user need to generate anything? But because the UID, like the code, won't be able to update it itself. Like the as it's static inside the code, I, I think I should go, like we can have a separate meeting on that. And uh, okay. I, I think we need to prepare the demo and the discovery service. So you might understand more the way I was uh, thinking it. Maybe yeah. like, and challenge me on that. But I will, like if you have time uh, in the next week, you know, we can probably separate. Yeah, yeah, because I'd love to understand your scenario. Um, because I don't, I, in your particular mm -hmm. use case, I don't think ID is any different than name at that point. Everything's hard coded in your code. So I don't think there's any difference there. But yeah, let, let's talk offline but about that. It, I like to understand yeah. it better. Yeah. Yeah. Ryan, sure. your hand was up. I want to pick on you since you were going to say something. <laughs> <laughs> um, so just looking at this with fresh eyes, I don't have a whole lot of context. But um, what is a little confusing is the first two sentences of the description are a unique identifier for the service and a unique identifier for the service for both name and ID. So um, at the very least, if we move forward with this, we might want to clarify the difference. Um, uh, and I know it's clarified a little bit um, technically, but like, what are what's the intent um, of how this is used versus ID? Gotcha. Yeah, I, I could see that being confusing. I can work on that. <clears throat> but I still think, and maybe we're not going to come to a resolution on this call, unfortunately. But I still think we need to to resolve the overlay, the, the higher order bit, which is, should name be immutable, right? Because I think if, if once you make that decision, I think it resolves everything else, right? If name is immutable, then we don't need ID. If name is mutable, then I think we need something like ID. But, yeah. so I, I'd like yeah. to get a sense from the group, is name, can name be changed by the, by the provider? So me, for me, no. Okay. Like, if you change, you create a second service, okay. even if it's identical. So I know, Klaus, you're in favor of keeping it immutable, right? Well, I, I wonder if it's really an identifier if you make it mutable. Well, I think I think Ryan is correct. This text here might need to change. Oh. Yes, I agree. It, it's, I still think you probably need name to be unique because I think it'd be very confusing if you had two services both called GitHub from a user perspective. Yes. But I, but I, think, I think the wording here is a little bit awkward because it's not meant to be sort of, well, we can talk about it later, but I think, I think the wording here needs to be changed slightly. I agree with that. I don't know. I, uh, got a, lot of, a lot of quiet people on here. If I may, the thing the the fact that you kind of acknowledge the fact that it should be unique it's more logic for humans that it's unique kind of uh, is an argument in a sense that it's immutable in my opinion. yeah but the, but you got to understand there's a difference though right this name needs to be unique at any one point in time in the sense that when you look at the complete list of services you don't want to see github show up more than once that, hopefully everybody agrees with that but the fact that it can change over time is okay because that just because the, the uniqueness here is just to make sure that the user doesn't see duplicates in his list right the uniqueness of id is there to unique is to be able to unambiguously identify which service you're talking about when you get metadata 
And that's why it's, it's, it's more for internal uses. I would never expect the ID to be exposed to users ever. This is like, this is like you owning a, um, a static IP address and then you're using a DNS name for it. Right now that's IBM.com. And then once this reverse takeover is over, it's going to be Red Hat.com, but it's still pointing to the same, to the same endpoint. Maybe a good comparison, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but <laughs> so if, if I continue to, with you, what you usually do is you have the old DNS and the new DNS pointing to the same IP because like that the way you will do the migration. And at one point in time, you remove the old one. So. So, so Thomas, you you, mm -hmm. so Thomas, your so hands up. Yeah. For me, a name really implies something which might change over the time. And, and this uniqueness of a name, it's going to be hard to achieve. Uh, I'm not sure in which scope uh, you were thinking of uh, having a unique name. So I, I'm in favor of having a UUID per service. And uh, yeah, as we know, and, and you, you showed the examples, I mean, storage as a name and, and that might be people choosing for the name just this simple uh, uh, storage and, and then uh, i'm pretty sure somewhere else a uh, storage will will pop up and then you're really confused as a as a client and, and user of of these discovery services then you have a storage there and a storage here and which one is which and i'm in favor of an id okay uh, john your hands up yeah, I, I guess uh, I'll say the same thing, right? The, the, the changing of the names is, is totally different from, from a, a hard ID that you're going to use and rely on uh, as the actual identity of the underlying service itself as it's alive. I guess my question to you, Doug, is do, in terms of the, uh, what some people have called the life cycle of this thing, like are you, you expecting that to live across multiple iterations or do you envision the id being used as each um you know like each uh, release of the service having a different id that's an interesting question um my initial thought was it would oh, it would it would be the same across versions of the service <clears throat> because from the end user perspective it is the same service now if a producer chooses to uh, treat version one and version two as completely different services then then yes i think there'd be different ids and the you know, fact that they happen to share the same base name and then they, they differ in the v1 versus v2 part of the name that's just an interesting side of that's just an interesting bit of trivia right at that point um, but if they really are separate services, then they get different IDs. But if they're the same service and one is meant to sort of replace the other one, then I think it's the same ID. Right. So then my my suggestion is to put some 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 you know like into the primer or something like that, some clarification around you know those, those uh, that variability. Right. Yeah, otherwise, yeah, I mean, you can hear in people's comments, right? There's there's different distinctions of what people are gonna key off of, um, I guess pun intended, uh, hmm. to, uh, you know, to decide what they're, what they're actually interacting with, right? And like you say, different versions, different people have different models of what versioning is and whether that's significant to their uh, use case or not. Okay, great input, thank you. Uh, Brian, your hands up. Back with my naive questions again. Um, I'm wondering if uh, if the use case we're thinking about here is that somebody would have queried the discovery service in the past, saved this ID, and then in the future will be coming back to the discovery service to make sure, for example, the URL hasn't changed. So they want to hit this endpoint again. They come to the discovery service and use this ID to get the URL that they should be using. Is that an accurate description? Basically, that's one way to do it, yeah. I mean, you're not gonna, I'm not, whether, you actually, whether we allow them to query by ID or, or not, I don't know. The, my, my use case was a lot simpler. It's just, 
maybe every week some client does a query to the discovery service to say what services this does this provider offer right and as they get back that list they need to know for every single service they get back is it a new service or do they just update the metadata on existing service right and i don't know how to do that today if name can actually change but it is the exact same service um how do we expect somebody to update a URL for a service? Uh, elaborate a little on what you mean. Um, so if, if you weren't thinking of that use case of somebody coming back to find out what the current URL for a specific service is, um, if the URL for a service changes, how, how do we expect uh, clients of that service to figure that out? Well, I think that does fall back in the scenario I described in the sense that when you do your query, <clears throat> you'll get back the list of services. You'll be able to identify based, on, based upon the ID, whether it's in a new service versus an existing service. If it's an existing service, then you can just do a diff on each field to see whether it changed or not. And URL is just one of those fields, right? The same way the list of types might change. Hmm. Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I... Given uh, some things that I have uh, seen around naming things and branding and whatnot, it, it certainly seems nice to decouple this uh, into an ID away from a name. Um, I think I, I fall into the camp of, of folks thinking that, yeah, the name could probably change here. Okay, so tell you what, I feel like we've taken too much time on this one and I definitely don't think it's ready to be merged in any sense. And I'm not 100% convinced everybody's on the same page yet, especially Klaus and Remy and stuff. So let me do this. Let me go back offline and thank you all for the wonderful feedback and go back and rework it some more and we'll revisit at some point later and maybe it'll take another three weeks by and then Klaus will be back <laughs> and you can be, it won't even be merged by then and then you will have more rounds of it. But at least I feel like I, there is more work that needs to be done on my side to help clarify some things. So let me at least take the feedback you guys gave me and rework it a little and not push for any kind of decision now because I think it's too soon. Okay. One one quick observation about what was just said. Mm -hmm. um, have we defined events for the discovery service yet? Because because it's like, how do I learn about something changing in the discovery service? And uh, it strikes me that we could obviously use cloud events <laughs> mm -hmm. to notify people about changes in the discovery service. Just a thought. It sounds it sounds nice to me. <clears throat> you want to open up an issue so we don't lose track of that? Uh, sure. I should, cool. yeah, I should have I should have known that that causes work. All right. Okay. Yes. I will. <laughs> That'll teach you. <laughs> <laughs> but it, but it is a good idea though. I do like it. Yeah. Eat our own. I, I will write. Day. I will I will write that down immediately. Okay. All right. So as I said, I think we probably spent way too much time on this on this call. Um, any last comments though before we move on to the next item? Okay, cool. Thank you everybody for the feedback though. I appreciate it. Um, okay, I don't remember who opened up this one. That was me. Oh, there you go, cool. And you're on the call. You wanna to talk to this one? Yeah, basically I took your discovery uh, description, including the change of the ID <laughs> and uh, created a open API description of this uh, API of this discovery API. It's not perfect yet because I tested it with the uh, API management in the cloud and uh, the results are not exactly or the return value is not exactly what you would expect but at least it's a, a starting point and, and I thought I'd give it a try to to actually file it as a PR okay. and then seems that no one was uh, aware of this. <laughs> I didn't see any comments yet. Okay. Um, what do people think about this in general? I'm assuming people are okay with the idea of creating a, an open API specification for discovery, I assume, right? Any objection to heading that direction? Okay, so I guess my, my question for you, Thomas, is aside from the ID thing, which obviously is easy to remove, um, mm -hmm. Do you think the rest of it is a good starting point that we should try to merge today and just add to it as we go along? Or would you rather do some more changes first before we consider merging it? 
for me, I think it's a good uh, starting point. Uh, it, it's also executable, and uh, but it, it's also to try out for people to see what is actually the, the return or the, the the responses from this API description. Does it match the the expectations? And that that would be from my point of view a good starting point to uh, afterwards process issues or, or further change requests on that one but at least we have a starting point would be worth to to merge it already now and and actually the description i took over from from your discovery uh md file so it should actually match except of course uh, i mean the id would need to be removed mm -hmm. and of course the name still has this unique identifier for the service in right okay so for the rest of the group, um, <clears throat> if Thomas was to remove ID, because obviously that's not in the spec yet, for the rest of it, how do people feel? Do you, does everybody on the call want or need more time to look it over? Or, or do you think, eh, even if it's a little bit off, it's a good starting point and we can PR it later. How do people looking to approve this today minus the ID stuff? And, and if you need more time, don't hesitate to speak up. Just, just wanna know. This is only one, one projection of it uh, as YAML, right? One projection. Uh, what do you mean by one projection? Sorry. Well, one of my uh, one of my goals is to make sure that the discovery API can also be hosted inside of Kubernetes. Yeah. Oh, so Scott, I think you're asking a different question. I think you're, so we, in the discovery spec today has a REST API defined. I think you're suggesting, or you're wondering whether we will also support other types of REST APIs, in particular the Kubernetes API, right? That's right, exactly. Right. So I think that's a slightly different question, because I think all he's suggesting here is, given the current <clears throat> REST API we have in the spec, here's an open API for it. Exactly. And actually, the, the discovery API description already has a, a heading open API with, with three, three dots. So I thought that I'd give it a try for, for this part, for the REST API in, in open API YAML description. So Scott, I think, I think it might be worth you opening up a separate issue so we can track your question in terms of whether we want to support an alternative REST API. The same way someone opened up at a... Uh, uh, question about whether we support uh, query ML, if, that was, if that's what it was called. Okay, I will do. Okay. Okay, I, I, thank you, Lance. Lance says it's okay with him to, to check this in now or merge it in now. Anybody else have any comments one way or the other? Because I'm inclined to, to let it go in and then PR any changes that are, meet, are needed, but I don't want to rush it if people want more time. I'm good with that too. Okay, thank you, Remy. Anybody else want to speak up? Okay, one last chance. Any objection to approving Minus the ID. Okay, approved without ID. Okay, so if you can make that change, Thomas, we can then merge that. Thank you, everybody. Cool. Okay, thank, thank you. you so much. Okay, Christoph, it's weird. I could have sworn I saw a message go flying by my screen where Christoph said he wasn't gonna be able to make the call today, but then I couldn't seem to find it later. But he's on the call. So does anybody, did anybody get a chance to actually read this? This is, Another PR to try to address, I think it was Grant's concern about uh, structured mode and how it, structured mode versus batch mode. And there was some confusion about whether it's, they're all structured or, or different modes and all that kind of stuff. And I think this was Christoph's attempt um, to try to address that. Did anybody get a chance to read this or have any commentary on it? Okay. I have read it. Yeah, I, I was going to ask for more time, personally, because I started reading it this morning, and I got to admit, I got kind of confused when I was reading it, but I was also on a phone call at the time, so it may have been my own lack of attention, but it just seemed like it was, it seemed like it might have been hard for a newbie to try to understand all the various nuances between the terminology, but so I was going to ask for more time, but I, so I just wanted to see if anybody else on the call had any thoughts on it as to whether it was a step in the right direction or not. Thomas, yes. Yeah. As far as I remember, the discussion was a couple weeks or even month ago that in binary mode, it's really difficult to actually batch 
because uh, if you look at the example of HTTP in, in binary mode, you have header fields. So how, how would you do a, a batching of, of multiple events? But I, yes. I haven't read the, the PR yet, but I think this is around this, this part. So actually it, it, it disqualifies batching for binary mode more or less. Yes, I think, I think everything you said is true, yes. I think the, the biggest question was someone's reading the spec and they were confused as to whether batch is a structured mode or whether I mean, whether batch is a variation of structured mode or whether it's a separate mode. And it was more of a, a wording thing and, not, and less of a, a coding thing, I, th I think, anyway. No, I think it's a coding thing, too. Oh, is because it? Batched, I think, so my, my take is that batch is a bundling of a bunch of structured messages. Right. So it's a mode that wraps another mode. It's not a subset. It's a. It's some other thing. But. Okay. Well, then I say, I would strongly recommend that you read it, Scott, because I think if I remember correctly, based on what Christoph said, I think he was headed on the path of saying no. There's really only two modes: structured and binary. But then there are different flavors of structured, and one of the flavors is batched. And I suspect that's what he was trying to say here. So you may want to read it and, and chime in there if you think he's he's heading in the wrong direction. Okay. Anyway, I'm not hearing anybody jump up and down saying that they, let's merge this thing yet. At least for me, I want more time anyway. So we'll give it a little more time. Okay, any other comments on that one? Okay, there were two other PRs that were opened. They're both, I think, relatively new. So I don't think we can uh, technically merge them from that perspective. However, I just want to double check on this one. This seemed like a simple goof up on our part in the sense that we went from content from content type to, con to data content type we just forgot to change this particular file for avro um any any avro experts are on the call or <laughs> even novices on the call i think clemens you might ha you have some experience here um i don't actually think it changes the avro output i think it's just changing the cloud event type itself right this is just a simple typo fix for us right yes Okay. Um, exemplary mappings. Yeah. I'm pretty sure they're called data content think, type in our spec. Yeah, I think they are. Let me just double check. No, it's in the Avro. No, was, he, he was talking about this. Right? He's talking about yeah, mapping yeah, yeah. the cloud event data content type yeah. or yeah but that's the example so what's in that but the question is whether the schema that we have in 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 that document is uh, is right but i think it is oh you mean wait when you say schema you mean this one uh yeah look at that I'll mention content type anywhere in there at all. Yeah, I think that's generic. Yeah, we, we moved and that to generic structure. Uh, yeah, exactly. Like okay, great. Okay. Yes. So so then that does matter. Okay. So I think so I think as I said, I think this is just we left off the word data when we made the change. Yes, correct. So okay. that's that's just a bug. Okay. So I think it's just a typo. Um, even though it was only opened yesterday, I don't think it's controversial at all. Anybody have any objection to trying to merge this now? They do they want to wait? Go. Cool. Okay. Any objections to, to approving? Okay. Cool. I thought it was easy. I just want to double check because sometimes I'll make a mistake. Don't want to assume too much. Okay. This one, Klaus. Um, you want yes. to talk to this one since you're going to be gone next week? Yes. I thought I, I leave you something to discuss while I'm on vacation. <laughs> so <laughs> um, it's just a. a you, you started with this primer a uh, few weeks ago, and um, I wanted just to um, add a bit more to it. I think so far we've been mostly, or we just had um, use cases in there, starting with consumer ones. And so I thought I add a few to um, well, get the discussion started that uh, are more about intermediaries or producers. And that's what is in here. So one is about an intermediary that has somehow to provide discovery for all the producers um, 
it stands for and so it's, it has to somehow aggregate what I call event catalogs of those producers. And um, on the other hand, producers have also to register with some intermediary or that provides discovery or subscription. And that has also to happen somehow. And, and that's maybe also partially what I had in mind when we were discussing this UUID thing, so. Any questions for Klaus? Okay, I have one. Um, your your language here seems to imply certain things. For example, you, an intermediary you said it aggregates, and I agree with you that it can aggregate, but I, it, you can have intermediaries that don't, I assume, right? Yes. Right, yes. I, we, we might just need to tweak the wording to imply that we, they we, can. We, we intentionally separated the discovery endpoint and the intermediary. So, but in this case, it's uh, the case that the intermediary is also, um, providing discovery and uh, subscription. Well, it, I think it has to aggregate in, in order to, well, it depends how it is built, but in this case it is aggregating it. But uh, was it your intention to apply that that's its purpose in life is to do an aggregation as opposed to just be a front end for something? Well, <laughs> it's, it's something like a message bus. So uh, you're subs you have to, consumers, um, subscribe to it and, and want to get events and don't know about the producers. So, um, right, but, okay, let me, let me ask a different question. From the client's perspective, the intermediary will look like the discovery endpoint, correct? Yes, maybe. Okay. Uh, but it's it's not only about discovery. It's also about being able to to handle subscriptions for the intermediary. If it gets subscriptions from a consumer, it has to um, to to route those subscriptions, maybe even to multiple producers. If if it's a something like a wildcard subscription. Yeah, I guess I guess the reason I'm asking these questions is because I'm wondering whether. I, so, I phrase this right. So, I agree with you in general that you can't have intermediaries. That makes sense. Um, but I'm just wondering whether that's more of an implementation detail, or whether it's something that a consumer actually needs to know about, or whether to them there's just one or more endpoints out there, and whether they all point to the same physical endpoint, or they're you know the subscription endpoint is slightly different from the discovery endpoint. They're all just URLs, and, it's, and the the client's just going to follow the URLs, right? I mean, do we need to. Does the client need to actually understand the the notion of intermediary as opposed to just there's a bunch of URLs so, that, that they're getting returned? I guess that maybe the the things we discuss here. Um, if if this spec is only for um, interoperability between consumers and something else, or if it's also discussing for example, interoperability between intermediaries, or uh, I mean, also looking at the other perspectives on this eventing. So that's interesting. Are you asking whether our specifications should talk about uh, the APIs or interoperability between the components behind a discovery endpoint? Um, maybe so, yes. Oh, yes. I mean, we, we had um, this also when we were discussing discovery in the in the smaller round, and that time we were we said that we would um, postpone this discussion until later on. But I thought at least um, introducing those use cases now um, couldn't hurt. Interesting. Okay, I'll have to think about that. Thank you. Thank you for the clarification. Anybody else want to chime in and ask Klaus any questions before he vanishes for a couple of weeks? Uh, Ryan, your hands up. I, I guess w with in the context of the cloud events specs, what's special about an intermediary? Well, it, it has to also get the information it needs to uh, to provide uh, the service. So um, so far we just have this discovery uh, query interface, but. Um, intermediary also has to, to get the information about the producers. So they have to hand over the, the, a list of events they pr may produce, things like this. Okay. 
any other questions? Okay. Um, so I think this was just, op was just opened yesterday, so it's too soon to merge anyway. Um, but obviously, if you guys have any questions, please open up issues or um, comments in the PR. And uh, they may have to wait for Klaus to get back, but we'll see. <laughs> All right, thank you, Klaus. Anything else you want to mention on this one, Klaus? No, I don't think so. Okay, cool, thank you. All right, in that case, technically we're at the end of the agenda. Um, for anybody that owns these issues, um, actually, yeah, so I, I need to rework the pagination stuff. I think the rest, the other four are owned by Francesco. So uh, Francesco, are, are there any of those issues that we should discuss now or are ready to discuss? I think they all have some outstanding work items associated with them, don't they? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, uh, I just want to point out that we are looking for feedback in the first one. Oh, yes, good point, yes. So please review that one again. Um, I know Lance, you made some comments just a few minutes ago, so thank you. <clears throat> okay. With that, we're on to discovery spec, or in interop on the discovery spec. Um, for myself, I have not had a chance to do any coding for a couple of weeks, unfortunately. Um, Remy, is there anything from your side that you want to mention? No, I know you were working on something. But, uh, okay. Yeah, uh, just if we can try to meet uh, during the week, I'm helping you on Slack to try to find a slot. Yeah, okay. it would be great, I agree. I think, to do a work yep. session. Yep, sounds good. Okay, anybody else have any input or thoughts? Anybody else thinking about implementing anything in this space to join the interrupt? Well, um, on I, I am. Um, still, I still am there, yeah. Uh, I just need to do KubeCon stuff first. <laughs> <laughs> I got a comment on that in a minute, yes, but uh, Manuel, go ahead. Yeah, I'm uh, still checking, but I think I might be interested uh, to join the effort. So Excellent. if you have a meeting in between, uh, please count me in. Yeah, we haven't planned on scheduling any meetings yet, but that might not be a bad idea. I think maybe we just need to get past some of the current flurry of activity that people are doing, like for example, Scott mentioned KubeCon and stuff like that. So maybe we'll look to set up a meeting in the not too distant future to get everybody on board and use that as a forcing function. Yeah. Anyway, Slinky, your hands up. Well, if, if we have a, an open API uh, specification schema, we, we, we don't need to, to do any work to implement uh, the client. I mean, That's are, very optimistic of you. No, no, no. The, <laughs> I, I mean, I, I worked a lot with open API and most of the times the, there are a lot of co-generators co out there and most of the times the co-generator really does most of the work. I know that's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, well, we'll, we'll see. <laughs> As I said, it's very optimistic of you. Now, Thomas, your hands up. Yeah, yeah just to add <clears throat> to that one, because I, I tested the open API spec with the Azure API management. And yes, of course, you can just echo the examples which are in the specification. But if you want to have something like uh, returning multiple services or returning uh, specific service uh, or, or having a, a matching uh, thing. I'm not sure. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not an expert in, in uh, sophisticated generators of, of code, but I think there you still need to do some coding for it. Doug, you're on mute. Crap, I was talking for five minutes. <laughs> I apologize. <clears throat> um, that's technically the end of the agenda. Um, any other topics we want to bring up? All right, going back to the uh, attendee list. Um, I got my well, Ginger, are you there? I am, sorry, I was a little late. Yeah, no problem. Uh, Sanjay, are you there? 
Oh, actually, he dropped off. <clears throat> and then someone else just joined. I saw it. Where was it? Somebody's name went flying by a second ago. Daniel, that's it. Are you there? Yes, I'm here. Excellent. All right. Um, anybody else that I missed? All right, cool. In that case, I think we're done. Um, let me just double check though. For anybody who is not interested in SDK, you're obviously free to leave right now, but let's just double check and see if I have anything on the agenda. Do, do, do. So nothing except my security email thing. I'm inclined to, okay, <clears throat> anybody else? Not SDK stuff, you're free to go. SDK folks, quick question for you. We recently created this email address. Um, so that we can receive emails or sign up with different sites for doing testing or build stuff and stuff like that. It is a private email address that only the maintainers have access to. Um, somebody suggested we need an email address for people to raise security concerns about the SDKs. Any objection to using this email address for that purpose? That way any email would technically be available to all the maintainers. I would just add a, the plus security or something, a little tag. Thank you for reminding me. Yes, I thought about that earlier today, based upon the other conversation. Thank you. Well, I would, uh, 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 to be honest, I think it would be better to, uh, uh, because, you know, the security, the, uh, it's for each SDK, maybe just CNCF Cloud Events plus the name of the SDK, like plus uh, Rust plus Java, I think it's fine for security. So we, uh, for example, in uh, SDK Java, we can say for any security concerns, write to uh, CNCF Cloud Events plus Java, uh, at gmail.com. I think it makes more sense. Any comments on that? Yeah, that's fine too. Just some way to, some way to limit it. I mean, it all goes to the same email address, right? It does, but uh, uh, having, having a standard, uh, uh, having a standard extension uh, plus security or, or, or whatever that specific, uh, I think is useful. Otherwise, people might just plus, you know, oh, oh, I think it's Java SDK, so they might they say plus Java slash SDK, or you know, it, it becomes less useful for filtering purposes uh, if we don't have like use this one uh, extension. Okay. Yeah. Any objection then to doing to using this email address, but then doing a plus with the SDK name at the end of it, or in the middle, right before the at sign? I think. Okay, I will take the action item then to, I guess, create some PRs in the various repos to add that to the readmes or something like that. I'll figure it out. Okay. Any other topics for the SDK side of the house? Okay. Oh, sorry, I have, I have oh. one really quick one. Um, yes, sir. I uh, Maybe two. I'm going to ping the Slack channel for um, SDK maintainers to contribute samples of uh, several exercises for the KubeCon talk. So look for a Slack message there. Uh, I need to work that out. And then um, I had, so I'm sorry, I had something else. And I lost it. So I guess- well, while, you, while you're thinking, the other thing I forgot that I was gonna mention in the previous call is, uh, since you mentioned KubeCon, Clemens and I did do the recording for KubeCon China and EU. It's actually the exact same recording. We just use it for both. We removed the location specific information from our charts so it could be reused. Um, I believe I, if I did it correctly, I've loaded both the presentation as well as the video into our Cloud Events Google Drive thing. Um, if for some reason you folks can't get to it or I put it in the wrong spot, let me know. Um, but I think I've uploaded the right one. Um, but it is available for you guys to look at if you really want to. Okay. And Scott, I remember the second thing. There there you go. Think of a CLI repo for which. So right now we have the conformance, and that's turned into uh, more of a uh, the more of the uh, cucumber tests. I wonder if people might be interested in a cloud uh, a cloud events CLI to help kind of send and receive and do other things for cloud events. Would kind you a Perl plus plus that uses cloud events. Are, are, are you thinking about having all the SDKs move their CLI stuff into this repo? No, no, it would be a separate cloud events CLI. So you can send and receive and 
it basically what's in the conformance test that I built, but maybe we can make it better. And what might, and so that's Perl? No, make it better. It's, it's in Go. Oh, it's in, so, but then I guess I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm being dense. What's the difference between say that Go CLI versus the Golang SDK CLI? The Golang SDK doesn't have a CLI. Oh, I see what you mean. It's just a library. Got it. It's, a, it's an installable tool that you can use to interact with cloud events. Anyway, I'll, I'll make an issue and we can debate about it. Well, let me ask the question. What do people think? Uh, uh, just a question. Uh, how, how does it differ from putting that code for the CLI straight inside the SDK group? I mean, we could do that, I think. What do you think about that, Scott? Well, I think the implementation doesn't matter as much as the, the command line interface. So it's, a, it's not intended to be a, a library at all. It's intended to be a thing you install. Yeah, exactly. You, you, we could do the same putting that in SDK Go, right? We go yeah, but it, and... it should work with uh, other languages too. It's not, not necessarily a Go thing. Okay. Lance, your hands up. Uh, yeah, I'm, I, I would like that. <laughs> I would like it um, for, uh, I like the fact that the conformance, I w eh, I'm bumbling here. Um, the, the cucumber stuff um, would be nice to have as a, um, a uh, what do you call it, a, a subrepo uh, in uh, the SDKs, but it's got all this, it's got the CLI stuff in it that kind of clutters everything up. So at a minimum, I would like that stuff to move into another repository. Yeah, I, it turns out I use that thing all the time. And uh, so I'm suggesting that we take the code that's there and move it to a CLI repo in cloud events and then leave the conformance as just Cucumber. Yeah, that would, I would like that personally. Okay. Anybody else want to jump in there? Go on. Okay. So, do we need to actually open up edition to discuss it, or do we just create the repo now? Do people need one more time? Doug, give me more work. Come on, man. <laughs> Okay, tell you what, why don't you ping the Slack channel and if there's no objection to the Slack channel, then we'll just open up the repo and you can go for it. How's that? Sounds good. Okay, cool. All right, any other topics? Nope. All right, in that case, everybody have a good rest of your day. Thank you. All right, bye everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.